let us start with these slides Okay, so as we discussed yesterday, uh, there are a number of I/O buffering techniques available, fine. And uh, I/O has to be buffered because whenever you are reading the input from the I/O device, it is a time-consuming process, right? So every time the system allocates a number of buffers, right? That may start from a single buffer, or it may go up to n buffers, right? Depending upon your system's uh, capacity, right? and we would also like to read ahead right there is also a term called reading ahead so anyone has heard of this term reading ahead what does that mean as you know uh, if you are going with block by block transfer uh, while one block is read and it is under process what we should do ideally we should read the second one right yes or no yes exactly pre read you can say that right so uh, that will ultimately save your time because io operation is a costly operation right it is going to slow down right if you don't do that fine so that is why reading ahead is mostly recommended fine and uh, this also introduces one more concept that is called principle of locality uh, although we are going to discuss this in uh, memory management but let me give you a brief regarding this right whenever one process is reading from a file right so ideally the file is stored in a sequential manner right so if you are reading the file block by block okay so it won't be possible that after reading one block from the one file you will immediately switch to any other random file is that going to happen while you are reading one file we generally read it in sequence right agreed we generally read that in sequence only right it won't have switching mostly right so that is called locality right principle of locality whenever we are trying to access some particular file or some database right we stay into that area for some period of time and then once their job is over yes you will be switching to the, some other file or some other record right but for some time your locality remains constrained within some memory locations agreed right so in this situation reading ahead will be beneficial reading ahead will be beneficial are you getting the point yes so that is an important point we will discuss once again regarding principle of locality because it is a memory management concept but as we are uh, having io uh, read and write in this chapter so that i am covering the topic okay now what are the different types of buffering we have seen either we go with no buffer yes process mostly remains in locality that's correct sanish right but if you are switching continuously between processes then locality might not be maintained that is also one possibility right so it depends upon how your system is executing and handling your processes right yes so if there is no buffer yes no buffer one buffer and remaining circle buffer yes i will be starting with that ojit so if it is no buffer that means we are reading the data directly from io device to user process so what is the role of os over here can anyone tell me what role os is playing in do, uh, this no buffering scheme we covered this quickly yesterday so i am going in detail today yes what is the task of os if you are having no buffering pass the content from io to process okay connect io with user yes basically role of os would be to allow the process to talk with the io device right yes that's right to allow the process to access the io device because as a process generally you can't access the io device without os os permission because you might have to invoke some system calls in background you might have to invoke some system calls right so that is why 
the only role of os is just keep on uh, checking with the permissions right okay if you go with single buffer the role of os increases because now what os has to do additionally except managing the io request what else is being added over here yes can you expand the role of the os allocation of memory or ma managing the buffer uh, that is given over here right also have to be ready for next request that's correct right so os has to first allocate the memory for a single buffer for that particular process that is the first thing right once that is done it has to keep track of the input and output movements input and output movements that are occurring from the io device to the user process right so uh, if you are having a single buffer can we have asynchronous communication you are all aware with asynchronous communication right you are having uh, two types of processes going on right yes it is still possible why because when buffer is allocated right the process can be either put in block state until the data is received or what is the other option you can you can let that process do something else right and while that process is doing something else what can be going in background reading of data right? yeah yeah asynchronous this is example of synchronous right because as the data is coming on coming in and data is being being moved in the user process at the same time that's what we mean by synchronous communication right or you can say request and reply kind of mechanism right asynchronous means that we would like to decouple right the sender from receiver ideally right or it is one way in the other sense we can say that right so over here what we are having is suppose a user process request the io device right after that if the io device is free okay then what os can do it can do the reading task in background and if there is no dependency on the data what your process can do at the same time it can do some other job yes or no if there is no dependency on the data which you are looking for i hope you are getting the point right okay so we can have a disconnected behavior basically we can have a disconnected behavior between your process and the os okay so the concept is like this the data may be read at any point of time right but when we will move into the user process that is not fixed when we will move that data into user process that is not fixed right so there is a decoupling over here right okay but what is the disadvantage of this mechanism can you have a reading ahead uh, uh, system over here can i re read the next block ahead of time no right because i have only one storage space storage space right so it is not possible okay so this is the concept of uh, block oriented and single buffer we make the input input transfers to the buffer then block is moved to user space when required remember right this is what is meant by decoupling the sender and the receiver okay next block is moved into the buffer after the buffer is empty right next block is moved into the buffer after the buffer is empty okay and that is called reading ahead or anticipated input okay but if your locality does not hold if your locality does not hold is there any point in reading the block ahead or in advance if you are having random access right not sequential access then it is not possible but luckily most of the time processes maintain locality and that is why uh, we have the concept of virtual memory if locality is not there the concept of virtual memory is not possible right as we will see in the third session phase right it is a very very important principle that you have to understand before we go into memory management okay we'll discuss that uh, after the sessional phase right okay so what we assume as i said we assume that data is usually accessed sequentially that means we are remaining within the locality okay that is the assumption which we are going with okay if you go with stream oriented data and single buffer stream oriented data and single buffer in that case will be reading line at a time 
or byte at a time what are the examples of that when you will be reading line at a time or byte at a time line is is the example or you can say for line you can say terminal is your example right when your uh, you can say end line end of line encounter is it encountered at that point uh, you will read the next line right? that is the process uh, what is byte at a time example your keyboards mouse right they are generally transferring data byte at a time right so in this case right uh, when you are having byte at a time system it suits the devices where a single keystroke may be significant what is the meaning of single keystroke which example we are trying to point to it is the thing that you are typing with right it is the keyboard when you press one key one byte will be transferred right so that is the mechanism we are having okay this also applies to sensors and controllers right uh, nowadays we are having iot coming up right so you have many sensors and many controllers who will be controlling the devices right so single buffering can also be applicable for stream oriented devices but that won't be very efficient why because it can maintain only fixed amount of data right what if your data is continuously coming like if you are having a satellite sensor right you will be reading uh, you can say hundreds of byte in a second right will the single buffer uh, scheme be suitable for that if you are having continuous flow of data in that case it won't be suitable right so you need more buffers that is the only solution okay so this is just a simple mechanism right we are going with a simple uh, single buffer okay to make the advantage further we can go with a switching mechanism right so as you can see there is a switch over here right so initially what will happen your data will be read in this buffer right data will be read in this buffer and then this switch will move to the second buffer what does that mean yes what is the meaning of switching from one buffer to the other from the io device side when you have filled the first buffer you will move to the second one right that is the basic meaning right so that's why we are having switching and when the input switch has moved to the second buffer what we can do on the output side over here yes when your switch is in this position yes yes surely sanish i'll repeat see right now your switch is in this position that means you are reading the data into the first buffer is that fine right and during that time can your user process start reading while your buffer is being filled can your user process start reading no right that is a very obvious thing right but when the first buffer is full the switch will sw uh, go from here to here right and now what i can do is i can move the output switch over here from the first buffer are you able to understand this right finish is that fine yes okay so that is why we have a switching mechanism right we will keep on switching from one buffer to the other as far as uh, the time goes okay and what is the benefit of this while one data is being processed the second data would be read ahead right so the principle of locality would be happy right in this situation okay so this is the benefit of two buffers okay so it is mentioned over here a process can transfer data from two or from one buffer while os empties the uh, first buffer okay then single buffer will be totally violated yes so in this case we are discussing a separate scheme sanish this is double buffer right it is a different scheme altogether so it is not comparable with single buffer right can both switch be placed on the same buffer at any point of time yes but that won't be having any meaning right or is it because if you are thinking about reading ahead then your switch will be on different buffers at a single time right so yes it is possible technically but practically it is not applicable right okay let us continue if you want to be uh, in line with your process execution let us say your process is having very high end cpu it can execute very fast right but io devices have been historically very slow 
right? Although nowadays you have SSDs and all those devices, but still they have not been able to match up with the CPU speed, right? So what we can do to maintain a balance, right? The only option is we go with multiple buffers, right? And your switches keep on moving, right? Again, you will have switching mechanism on the left hand side and right hand side. But this time, what is the advantage? You can have even parallel reading possible. You can also have parallel uh, processing, right? That is also possible in this situation, right? So basically, you can read more data, right? Than the uh, double buffer scheme. In double buffer, we could read only one buffer, right? We could read from the first buffer only at the first point, right? Over here, we have a better chance. Are you clear with this scheme? Circular buffer? Pre reads in double buffer. Yes, yes, it is applicable. Why not? See, when you are reading over here, when you are reading the first block, right? Let us say your first block is residing over here, right? And then this switch will move over here for reading that, right? And while this switch is over here, you can start reading the second block, isn't it? Yes, or is it? So that is pre read. So pre-read uh, definition keeps on uh, getting extended. That's what we can say, right? Concept remains same, OK? Same applies to circular buffer or not. Can we do pre-reading? What is the further benefit in, pre, uh, in circular buffer? Instead of reading one buffer ahead, if you are having 10 buffers, let us say, right? Circular buffers are having buffer count is equal to 10 then uh, how many buffers you can read in advance while you process one? Nine, right? Obviously. Okay, so while you are reading from one buffer, you can have nine buffer data, right, in advance. So if you want to have even parallel reading, right, that is also possible. Okay, so if you want to empl employ this scheme, your CPU must be capable. Right, because uh, otherwise there is no uh, point in wasting your memory on multiple buffers at a time. Right, you should be able to be capable of reading multiple buffers at a time and process them parallelly. If that is the case, then this scheme is very good. Right. Okay. So why? When do we use circular buffer? Right. If that is the question, the answer is this: It is used when I/O operation must keep up with the process. That means we want to speed up the IO, right? So we won't be sitting idle waiting for the data, right? Data would be lying in the buffers. As soon as you are free, you can immediately read your data, okay? So the execution would be faster, right, in this situation. Okay, at initial request, there are nine pre-reads. After that, only one pre-read will be there. That's correct, Urjit. That's correct, right? But if you are doing parallel reading, then you can increase the number of pre-reads, yes? If you can read four blocks at a time, right? If your CPU supports that, then that will be beneficial, right? Okay, now we are entering the important uh, area of this chapter, uh, disk performance parameters and IO scheduling, right? So all of you are aware about hard disk, right? Uh, you might have studied that in your basic computer uh, introduction subject, right? So every hard disk has, uh, you can say, uh, what is the basic component of a hard disk? Yes, what it is made up of? Disk platter, that's correct. And head, right? So your head is first placed on the track, right? As you are aware, your hard disk is, hard disk is continuously rotating, right? So first of all, whenever you want to read something, your head has to be positioned on a particular track. And tracks are in a circular manner. Okay, but the track is again divided further into number of sectors, right? Track is further divided into number of sectors. So once you reach the track, your job is not yet done, right? You need to reach the appropriate sector, okay? And when you reach the sector, you can actually fetch your data. Are you clear with this mechanism, right? Your disk has to be positioned, right, at an appropriate place right, that is on a particular track, okay, after it reaches the track, it has to be positioned on the sector, 
okay and within this sector my data is residing okay that is how the io devices work okay so in general what is the timing diagram let us observe this part the first part of this uh, timing diagram is this much right initially we wait for the io device that means we have requested the io device but the io device is not yet ready so until it becomes ready we will have to wait right then what happens is once io device becomes ready we have to be prepared for transfer of data we have to be prepared for transfer of data and to transfer your data what is required channel right you need a communication channel are you clear up to this right first you have to wait for the device then you have to wait for the channel now the actual job task uh, starts right so if the channel is available channel is ready then comes the seek time seek time is nothing but it is a time until uh, you actually place your head right or you position your head at a proper location right we will see the definition later on right so don't worry about that right so seek means we are searching we are searching for an appropriate position that is the basic meaning right then comes rotational delay right rotational delay means your as i said your disk is continuously rotating right so your head has to be positioned on a particular track issue with the network Yes, am I audible once again? Okay, uh, there was a network failure for some time, so let us continue, right? Okay, so we were discussing regarding the uh, seek time rotational delay, right? Once, once you reach the track, right, your seek time is over. Once you reach the track, your seek time is over. then the sector has to come under your head then the sector has to come under your head and that is known as a rotational delay right i am just giving you rough definition we'll see the detailed definition in next slide okay seek time is nothing but positioning your head on the track that is the first thing right rotational delay is nothing but until that uh, sector rotates and comes under your head and then what do we have data transfer time right so if i say transfer time is actually a summation of what transfer time is a summation of seek time plus rotational delay can i say that first you have to position your uh, track right and then you have to position on the sector okay that is the basic meaning we have and starting from waiting for the channel till data transfer your io device would be busy 
and that means what will happen to your process what will happen to your process for this much span of time it will be blocked obviously right so we want to minimize actually this time right uh, ideally that is why uh, the devices like ssds have come up right to increase or to decrease the delay right that's what we are facing over here okay fine so as i discussed the same concept is given given over here let us go through when the disk drive is operating disk is rotating at a constant speed okay now heads can be of two type as you might have studied in basic uh, subjects right either you have a movable head right or it is static head right if your move uh, if your head can be moved right then you can actually rotate that head and put that on the appropriate appropriate location that is one option the second option is if the head is fixed then electronically you have to select the appropriate track okay so depending upon the hard disk type you might be having movable head system or a fixed head system in any case the process remains same first you have to access the track then you have to access the sector and that's how you access your data okay fine so as i was saying this is the equation access time is a summation of seek time plus rotational delay right seek time is nothing but it is the time to take or to position the head on the desired track okay rotational delay is nothing but the time it takes for beginning of the sector remember it is the beginning of the sector of uh, that particular track to reach the head okay and then comes the transfer time transfer time is the uh, time taken to transfer the data so if you want to complete one cycle of reading one block right how many times i have to add up or how many values i need to add up seek time plus rotational delay plus transfer time right that forms one complete read operation are you following this right okay so based on these equations uh, small examples can be asked that is if you are given the seek time value and rotational delay value and if you are asked that what is the access time you just have to sum it up okay so and if you are uh, uh, even as the transfer time right so for that you might be given the required values so small examples can be asked in competitive examinations right so just uh, go through these concepts once right fine okay now we are going towards the scheduling policies so in uh, scheduling chapter that is process scheduling you have studied various approaches right first in first out lru right shortest job first uh, shortest process next right uh, there was a feedback scheduling also right similarly we have around uh, three to four popular policies for this scheduling right but let us first understand what is this scheduling right suppose you are having number of io requests right like this this is the sequence right where each number signifies the track that you want to read so 55 means it is track number 55 right 90 means it is track number 90 right as an os or as an io management uh, you can say device or io management logic you will be receiving this kind of request right now there are different ways in which we can schedule them okay so if we assume that disk head is initially located at track number 100 right because head is always uh, fixed at some track right and if you assume that it is on track number 100 and disk capacity is of 200 tracks right so we start from track number 0 and maximum number would be 199 are you clear with the basics right your track is positioned at uh, sorry your head is positioned at track 100 disk is having 200 tracks 0 to 199 and we are given this request okay so what is the simplest algorithm we can go with as we all know what is the simple or we can say most simple approach that we can opt yes fifo right first in first out we are not thinking optimal uh, allocation right now right fifo is the easiest policy as we have already seen right so if we go with fifo let us see how it spans out 
okay processes or you can say we will be processing the requests in a sequential manner right so uh, suppose 55 is requested first you will be reading that first right and so on so we will go in this order right so in this case as you are aware what is the advantage of fifo it is a fair scheduling policy yes because uh, uh, what about starvation then can starvation happen in case of fifo let us just refresh the concepts yes okay no and yes i am getting two answers in this case if you are processing every request right ideally the starvation should not happen right because every request will be honored right because we we are not having any kind of priority in this situation right so in general what we can say is starvation won't happen right if you are having uh first in first out scheduling right because you are going to start from the first request and you are going to go to the last request okay but what will happen if you are having intermediate requests then there might be slight delay are you following this and that's why i think some of you have written that starvation may be possible right but in an ideal fifo situation starvation does not happen right okay and if we assume that we are not allowing intermediate request that is the only assumption which we can go with right fine so it is a fair and every request is usually honored that is the advantage but what is the drawback it leads to random scheduling or it degenerates to random scheduling in worst case uh, what is random scheduling if you are having uh, 10 processes let us say at this time right then this process or this fifo might be working properly right but what if the number of pro number of processes rises drastically right every process requires a different sector to be read right so how your request will be spanning actually they will be in zigzag manner right the graph will be growing in a zigzag manner initially you will be reading from for process p1 that is let us say track number 20 and suddenly p2 comes up it requires track, track number 195 so from 20 you will go to 195 again you will come back right so actually p4 can degenerate to random scheduling if there are too many processes but if there are less number of processes p4 is actually a very good approach because it is easy to program easy to handle right you don't have to run a algorithm for this right separate algorithm okay let us trace this graph so suppose your track is at 100 right so which will be the first request you request will be taking up 55 right you can see this dot over here this circle so 55 and 58 will be handled first then it will go to 39 that is over here then 18 okay from 18 it is going to 90 fine right? from 90 it is going to 160 then 150 okay again it come back, comes back to 38 so this traversal is actually very long but as it is fifo uh, we have to go with it right so actually the seek time is getting increased isn't it you can see a long span over here long span over here right as well as a very long span over here right so what do you comment over average seek time for fifo higher or you can say it will be lower in general average seek time seek time means uh, you reach that track right that is the seek time right generally it is in higher side we will prove that when we will see the comparison at the end okay so this kind of sim simple example i hope you can solve right you are given a list of requests and if you are asked that uh, schedule these request as per the fifo right so this kind of graph you can prepare or you can prepare a table right anyway you should be able to solve this example fine it is not as difficult as the process scheduling you are not supposed to look at so many factors right okay let us go for the next one priority right now for priority we don't have an example but we'll just discuss the concept right because in case of priority the uh, goal is what 
goal is not to optimize the disk usage right but the goal is other that means support the higher priority process request first right although that might be costly but still we have to go with that that might involve even higher seek times don't worry right you have to go with that right so that is why uh, usually in this case we don't focus on optimizing the disk request right okay so what can be the approach what kind of the approach we can go with in priority disk scheduling right one of the approach is this you can assign higher priority to short batch jobs uh if you do this what will be the advantage if you are having a shorter batch job and if you are assigning that a higher priority what will be the effect of that on the uh, execution the throughput will be high yes or no remember that parameter throughput will be high okay so that is one approach possible there are many different approaches proposed by disk scheduling algorithms but we are not going in that detail right now okay so if you are going with this approach shorter batch jobs given higher priority you will get good response time right that is one benefit but what is the downside of this approach longer processes will be suffering from starvation right so it is not a fair scheduling priority is actually a biased way of scheduling and it can lead to starvation as i said in fifo we might not lead to starvation that is what in general but priority scheduling can lead to starvation okay that depends upon your logic fine so we are not discussing the example over here priority example you already seen in the uh, process scheduling so we are not going for that uh, in this case okay lifo last in first out right so if you go with last in first out what is the benefit you will get suppose you are uh, reading from process p1 and process p1 is requesting currently track number 30 right now are there any chances that process p1 will change the track request from 30 to 170 will you have a drastic change in the same process for reading your data in general i am asking right there can be exceptional cases you are at track number 30 right so generally what you would say is mostly you might request track number 32 right or 31 even in sequence or you might request track number 29 plus or minus 1 or 2 right what do you un uh, understand by this logic it is called locality right so if you are handling the request in a last in first out order right the locality will be preserved yes or no i hope you are getting the principle and the concept right okay i'll repeat i'll repeat urjit see when you are processing request from only one process right let us say p1 right so can p1 will be reading from two very far away tracks ideally what is the answer to that from your opinion maybe yes in worst case right but when you are reading your data in sequence mostly you will be reading from nearby tracks yes or no you will be reading from nearby tracks right so that principle is used over here okay we will be considering most recent request right why most recent request because the most re recent request may be from the same process most recent request may be from the same process and that is why you will be moving your head very slightly right plus or minus one or two tracks right best case getting it now right so the movement of the head will be minimum if we are going with uh, last in first out based mechanism request for resources or cpu yes yes we'll see the example right uh, we are going to look at the example uh, later on right so that you will be clear okay and uh, right now if you want the example uh, let us say you are at track number 30 for process p1 right now what is the best case that p1 will be requesting 31 or track number 29 isn't it because you will still be relying in your locality right so if you are reading or if you are moving your head from 30 to 
can we say that we are having minimum uh, movement of the arm minimum movement of the head are you getting this urjit right why nearest there can be other processes also yes right now we are discussing about single process because of principle of locality i hope you are getting right principle of locality says that generally your requests tend to cluster together request tend to cluster together so they will be bound by some range they will not move out of range in a standard execution okay so right now we are not comparing with with uh, this with fifo right are you following this yes yes good fine so if locality holds then what is the advantage tell me this is again an open question if locality holds what is the benefit you are going to get we will get minimum movement of head and as we are moving head minimum the throughput will increase right because the movement time gets decreased are you following this right as well as the second advantage is reduced queue length what do you mean by this reduced queue length yes can anyone give me some idea regarding this which queue length we are trying to reduce request queue request queue that's correct why because we are serving which kind of requests first that are received in that are received in short period of time right that are most recent request okay and if principle of locality holds if principle of locality holds those requests can be processed very quickly are you following this yes urjit are you clear with this now okay fine so okay yes i'm waiting for your doubt in fifo you can't use pol that's correct that's correct obviously because fifo is actually a random scheduling right okay why it is so because see you are handling first in first out right so in that case uh, it is possible that the first request was from from a very old process let us say from let us say p1 and this 184 is from let us say p10 and again you are having p5 over here or p4 over here fine so locality won't hold in that situation are you getting right we are not sticking with one process request we are not sticking with one process request right that is why it does not hold yes exactly and there are chances and there are chances that your same process will be requesting another track in nearby location right in yes yes we'll see that example for lifo we are going to see that okay let me just show you that okay right now i don't have that example but at least you can try that right if 184 you select first then next will be 38 only right because that is last in first out okay so actually in this example we are not getting the advantage i hope you are getting the point which i am trying to make right this is a general example i have taken from textbook right because we need to compare all algorithms on the same example that's why i'm going with this approach but if you have a example like this 150 let us say 160 170 and 184 right 150 160 170 184 can i say that locality would be preserved over there in case of lifo so in that in that kind of request lifo would be better agreed yes so i hope you are clear with this example right fine now but in lifo the request that came first have to starve forever yes yes so starvation is still there that that's what i was going to discuss next right there is a possibility of starvation since a job may never regain the head of the line what does that mean what if you are getting the request from nearby tracks right continuously so your head will never reach the first request 
right so actually you will have a starvation issue are all of you clear with this right so starvation is still possible okay but we are going to see some approaches which are starvation free right later on right fine sstf that is the next algorithm again it is very easy to understand shortest service time first or you can also say minimum seek time that we will select okay even you can observe that from the graph right see how we are moving the head right suppose it is at 100 so what you will do first you will search your entire request queue right so searching time is there over here but what you are searching for you are searching for a request that is nearest to the current request or nearest to the current head position right so right now you are at 100 so what you will be selecting first 90 right then from 90 where you will go if you go to 150 there is a huge distance right so we go back right so from 90 we go to 58 from 58 we we can go to 55 right from 55 we can go to 39 okay and then only one request is left on this side that is 18 so we will solve that right and then there is a long jump again from 80 to directly 150 right so only thing that will add up over here is this this time right but if you have less variation if you have less variation in the track numbers or track request then sstf can be the best algorithm yes or no if there is less variation in the track request then sstf can be the best algorithm in any case are we going to get a minimum seek time in sstf what is your observation saying as compared to others as compared to others what do you think about the average seek time reduced or less yes again it depends upon the length and variability right but in general we should uh, come up to one conclusion in general we can say that this is going to be the optimal algorithm right okay so in this case we always choose the minimum seek time right what is the drawback of this algorithm or what is the overhead we have let us summarize so that we can go ahead with the next one yes as such there is uh, you can say nothing major right only thing is if there is too much variation right then the seek time will still be high right average seek time i am saying right like over here see you are moving from 18 to 150 so that will add up yes and far one will be starving out that's correct urjit right you might still suffer from starvation right you have to wait basically that's correct right what else in terms of overhead let us forget about starvation and all those concepts for now what is there as a overhead search time exactly it is possible that in worst case your minimum distance uh, number is lying where at the tail of the queue so you will have to traverse the entire queue right and if you are having priority then yes uh, waiting is still there okay so clear with this sstf okay fine let us continue now we are going towards the popular algorithms that are uh, being used right uh, one of them is scan and the other is c scan right let us understand the policy first then we'll look at the example okay as we discussed earlier priority last in first out as well as sstf may have some request unfulfilled that is what do we mean by that starvation agreed we have starvation possible in all three cases okay this condition is usually prevented by scan algorithm okay what it does let us see initially your arm moves in one direction okay and actually you are scanning your disk that's why it is named as scan okay so you will satisfy all outstanding request on that path suppose you are starting with 100 and if your head is moving towards positive numbers 
right that is greater number sorry not positive greater numbers so from 100 you will go to 150 160 and so on right until it reaches the last track in that direction that is one stopping criteria or there are no more request in that direction okay there are two stopping criteria either you reach the last request or you reach the last track right there we stop okay and then direction is reversed that means you come back to the same path you come back to the same path so if you reach 180 right that was your last request and if your next request is 18 what you will do you went from 100 150 160 180 right then you backtrack and you go back to 18 okay and uh, this is a classical example okay how we will know that no more requests are there in that direction without reaching it yes you will have the request queue with you is it i'll surely repeat rishi uh, when we'll see the example i'll once again repeat right yes so this is known as an elevator algorithm this is the concept we have in a lift right we always keep on moving up to down right so that's why this is known as a Uh, elevator algorithm okay if it traverses in one part then another part won't suffer yes yes but that suffering won't be long you will again backtrack to that because the lift always comes back it does not stay at one point right so that is the approach we are using right okay don't worry we'll see the example that will make you clear fine suppose your track is positioned at 100 okay and if you assume that my head is moving in greater tracks direction right in exam also you might be given the direction where you are moving right either you are moving to the lower tracks or you are moving to the higher tracks that is generally mentioned in the question okay fine so from 100 where you are going to go first 150 right then you will go to 160 then you will reach 184 now you know that in that direction there are no more requests right because 184 is the uh, largest track request that we have okay now see what happens you go back right so from here where we are going back what is the position we are going to 90 right you can see what was written in the algorithm direction is reversed that is your track moves back in which direction we were moving into uh, you can say greater track direction and now we are moving towards lower track direction that is the approach we are having right so now solve the request yes back track means going to lower direction that's correct then right so from 180 see we are going towards 90 now from 90 keep going backward okay where you will go first 90 to 58 right 58 to 55 then 39 18 that's it we are done right so this is elevator we moved up we moved, went down right so actually in this case starvation won't occur but there is a biasing there is a biasing you can see over here scan is actually biased against the area most recently traversed so what if you are having an intermediate request in your nearby location what will happen ideally you are your track is nearby to that location and you are getting that request so will you skip that request or you will serve and then go ahead what is the ideal approach for example you are at track number 38 right and you are getting a fresh request for for track number 40 right so will you go from 38 to 18 or you will you will you serve uh, let us say uh, 36 not 40 36 and then go to 18 So thirty-six, right? So can I say that we are being biased to the area which we are recently traversing? I hope you are getting the point with the example, right? So yes, biasing is there, but starvation can be reduced, right? As we are covering the entire uh, hard disk, right? You are going to cover all the request, and that is why the probability of starvation is very low in this case. and this is the reason why scan is a popular algorithm right it is being used by many systems right let me quickly cover the last one then we will stop right 
C scan, right? The only difference is we move in one direction only. That means you look at the example from 100, we are moving to 150, then 160, 184, and then see what we have done. Instead of going to 90, where your head is positioned to zero, right? That is you move your track to zero. That is you start again scanning from zero. That means you will be solving 18. That's correct. Yes. Right. And then you continue. Yes. Yes. That is the approach. Right. So let us understand the process now, right? When the last track has been visited in one direction or last request, right? Either last track or last request, the arm is returned to the opposite end of the disk. What is opposite end of 199? Zero, right? And you scan again, okay? So this is called C scan. So what does uh, the C stands for? It is circular. It is standing for circular scan, right? So we are moving back, starting with zero. That is why it is known as a circular scan. So what is the advantage of circular scan? Are we avoiding the problem of biasing, which was present in scan to some extent? Yes, right? Because we are giving fair chance, right? We are starting from beginning. So chances are fair, ideally. So C-scan is a much improved version of this algorithm. Right? Okay. So with 0, 1, 9, 9, 1, 9, 9, 0. Yes, that's why it is called circular scan. That's correct, right? Okay. Starvation can be more agreed. Right? Possibility of starvation can be more because there is a long time, right? You are getting over here. Fine. Right? But that again depends upon request. Isn't it, Urjit? Okay. So what I'm going to give you uh, to study by yourself is this, this example. Right. Uh, this example is already there in your textbook. Right. FIFO, SSTF, scan and C scan. Just observe the average seek length. In FIFO, it is worst, 55.3, because as you know, it is random. For SSTF, as we know, it should be minimum because the seek time is always minimized. Right. Scan and C scan almost behave in a similar manner. Right. Why C scans average seek length is high? Can you tell me? We have just seen the graph due to this, right? If this path was not there, then C scan would have performed better than even scan algorithm, right? So in the end, what I would summarize uh, this as, it all depends upon the type of requests. And that is why your system always goes with multiple algorithms. And it chooses the best one depending upon the situation you have, OK? So I've already uploaded the slides up to this right on the folder uh, yes actually we are not going to have a, a lecture tomorrow because uh, uh, msb sir will be taking that class right uh, i have already taken msb sir's lecture so msb sir will be taking os lecture tomorrow but i'll surely sh share a lifo example with you right or it and i'll be uploading that on the uh, folder fine so that everyone can access okay so whatever material i have uploaded that is your syllabus Starting from concurrency and mutual exclusion, that chapter, except reader-writer problem. Reader-writer is not part of your syllabus for second session. Okay. Then deadlock, entire chapter. Okay. And from IO management, these two topics, IO buffering and scheduling algorithms. Right. All the material is already there. So go through that. If you have any queries, contact me. Right. Okay. Thank you and all the best. Right.